Take your Bible, Colossians chapter 3. Tonight is a little different message because it's coming from a different direction. Tonight we're going to come at the negative side of our life. What do I mean the negative side? Uh, that which would separate us from God. Matter of fact, sin does that, doesn't it? And tonight we're going to talk about that because he goes into verse 5 of chapter 3 saying, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. But remember again where we've been this week. We've talked about what Christ has done in his salvation for us, that he's paid the complete price. All sin has been taken care of, past, present, and future. So now we do not owe it anything, nor do we owe our flesh anything. We are not bound to it anymore. We can, because we've been given the ability be, to be godly in this present world. I can do what is right. There is no excuse for me not to. I've been given everything I need that pertains to life and godliness. My question always is, is then why aren't I godly and why aren't I enjoying life the way God intends? with peace and joy that comes from him. And something's missing if I'm not. And so we come back now tonight after this discussion that we've had the rest of the week about who we are in Christ, the great position that is ours, that my sins are taken care of. I do not need to suffer any torment or penalty for sin. Jesus Christ has paid it all. But now he's saying, I want to work on you. Last night we talked about our heart's affection. Who do you love? Do you love the Lord your God? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your might? And where is your heart's affection? And the thing that will really help you to get to where we understand or we grow in that love for him is to understand the concept, in him I have life apart from him. If I do not walk with him, I do not experience life. I'm only going to experience that as I walk with him, for he is life. He is my life. Now take your Bible as you look at Colossians chapter 3. He said in verses 1 through 4 these statements, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, mortify therefore, because of who you are in Christ, because of what Christ has done, because of this heart's attitude now, because of your affection set above, you're, you're seeking those things above that God would have for you in life, the things that God would intend for us in this life. We're following him with our whole heart. Now I'm going to work on you, he says. There are things that are detrimental to you. We don't like to hear that, do we? There's something in your life that is hurting you. We don't like to have somebody come to us and tell us something like that. But God has already given us security and stability. We're not going to fall apart because God comes to us and says, there's something with you that I need to change. He, we're not going to fall apart if we understand the security and stability that is ours. If you don't understand it, you're going to think the Christian life is a life of don't do this, don't do that. Yes, you should do this and you should do that. That's not the way God set forth a Christian life. A biblical Christian has joy in his heart, and when he has a love-based relationship with God, he sees God coming to him saying, Here, this is detrimental in your life. It's not good for you. It's not good for your relationships. I want to build you. I want to help you. I want to make you so that you can experience life more abundant. We say, Hey, God, give me all of it. I want whatever you want. I want to change. I want to grow. I'm putty in your hands. I'm clay. Mold me. Make me what you want me to be. 
So many times, Christians get so rigid. Somebody was writing on Facebook the other day, a pastor friend of mine in Arizona. He said, it must be the Arizona sun that bakes Christians so hard. They're so rigid and unpliable. They're unmovable in the sense of, not in the good things the way God puts unmovable in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, but they're unmovable and unpliable and they're not going to change anything in their life no matter if God told them they needed to change it. They're not willing to even look at it. I don't know how many times I heard this expression when I was a pastor in South Dakota. Well, that's just the way we are. That's just the way it is around here. Uh, that's just the way I am. Fine. That may be the way you are. But is that the way God wants you to be? Is that what God wants for your life? You're missing something. When you've got this rigidness that you're not going to change, you're going to be yourself and just be who you are, you don't understand the security and stability of Christ in your life. With Christ, I can change. I can be different. I don't have to be like the world. And so when he comes to me and he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Put to death these things that are in you. Uh, I like how he does it. He's doing it after he's already told us we're secure and stable in him. Now I understand that security and stability. Now I can change. If I'm not secure and stable, this will be a great difficulty in your life. It's like taking those things that are there that you're hanging on to, standing on, believing in, that being your identity because this is who I am. Uh, you know, I've always had trouble with my temper. My, my parents had trouble with their temper and it just passed down. You know, that's just kind of the way we are. And so we have an excuse for everything that is wrong in our life. You're missing something. You've missed what he's just taught in the first two chapters of Colossians. You're missing the heart's affection in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. You're missing that single-hearted loyalty to Jesus Christ. If I am going to follow him with my whole heart, when he says and comes to me, a perfect God coming to me and saying, okay, here's something that's not good for you in your life. Perfect God is going to deal with me rightly. I'm going to listen to Him. I can have confidence in Him. I can trust Him. And if we're living by faith, if our heart's affections are there with Him, then it'll be a simple thing when He comes to us and says, okay, let's put to death these things that are in your life that are detrimental to you. Look what He's saying in verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. And I don't want to go into all those particular things tonight and identify them all. I'm simply going to say, if you don't know what that is, look it up. There's a dictionary somewhere, right? Verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Okay. I think that's an interesting comment. The wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience because of those things. Verse 7, here's the comment that I want to look at. In the which you also walk sometime when you lived in them. This is a theme that we see throughout Scripture in the New Testament of God's salvation. Take your Bible and turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. When we understand the salvation that is ours in Christ, it takes away every bit of pride in our, spiritual, our spirituality. It takes away our pride in who I am. It gives us a point of glorying in our Savior because look what He's done with us. Look how He's changed us. Look what He's done to us. Verse 1, it says of chapter 2 of Ephesians, and you hath he quickened who were dead in sin, trespasses and sins. And the word quickened has the idea of made alive. Now he says in verse 2, wherein, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There is nothing for us to take pride in in who we were. So when God comes to you and me and says, let's get rid of some of these things that are detrimental to you, don't take pride in those things. Well, that's just who I am. No, there's nothing in us that would equate pride to glory in. What do I have to glory in that was good? Nothing. All of my good things that I thought were good is nothing but filthy rags before God. Even the things that I tried to do for him. Even before people are saved, they try and do things for God. It doesn't do any good because we do not have the ability to please him. We do not have the ability to do right acts. He says there are offerings, and it's an Old Testament thing. You see it over and over again. There are offerings, burnt offerings, and these. I don't have any joy. I don't have any pleasure in those sacrifices. They don't mean anything to God. You can do all you want to do. It's not going to amount to anything because there is nothing in us that gives us the ability to please within ourselves God. I can't. That's why I need Christ. That was the whole importance of what he said in chapter 1 and 2. I have no righteousness. I look at that and think about that for a minute. Um, the Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Was that before or after we're saved? That's an unfair question. Because it's both. I have no righteousness to bring to God. The Bible says that when I'm saved, Christ's righteousness came to me. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that made me fit or suited or meet to be a partaker of the inheritance in Christ. The inheritance of heaven. I know that's mine. I know that's mine because of what Jesus Christ did. He made me able to have that. He made me accepted in the beloved. He brought that about. I have nothing in me that would make me worthy, make me merited in any way. I, there's nothing there. So it takes away anything that you and I might have of pride in who we are. We have nothing to be proudful of. We have everything in him to give glory to. He did it all. It takes away pride in the believer. And one of the things that I find is what will stop us from experiencing that intimacy of relationship with Christ is pride. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The very next verse says, what will thwart that in your life? What will take you away from that? And he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Which is pride. Pride will stop you from believing God, from going on in your walk with God, from experiencing what God has for you. And to understand it, he does this over and over again when he tells us what we were before we're saved. Why does he emphasize that here? Why does he have that expression? And such were some of you. You walked in these things before. Verse 3 of Ephesians 2, among whom we also, we all had our manner of life, our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh. All of us needed a Savior. It takes away anything in us to be prideful in, and it gives us a heart of humility before our God, thanking him, praising him for the salvation that is ours. He brought it to us 
full and free. The life I now live is got to be Christ living through me. And if Christ is living through me, if you see righteousness in my life, it's because of what God is doing. It is what God is working through me. And if you see love in my life, if you see joy in my life, it must be the Holy Spirit. It must be Christ living in me. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And it must be that for us, because if it's not, then we are self-righteous, we are self-motivated, we are self-doing uh, everything towards self, self-conscious about everything. It's all about us. And that's not God's way. Because God's way says he will not share his glory with any man. It's all about him. Somebody asked me, and I think it's a valid question. Maybe I was just thinking about it. I don't remember if I was asked, but it's come up in several conversations. Why does God, I know where it started. I started thinking about it, and then I brought it up. Why does God demand that we bring glory to him when he tells us not to glory in ourselves? And yet he wants it all. You ever thought about that? That's that weird thinking I get into. I can tell you why. As I've thought through this thing, there's, there's one great reason why God should be glorified in everything. For him to not require us to glorify him is for him to deny who he is. And he cannot deny that. He cannot deny that. Now he set aside that when Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. He set that aside. That's why it's so important in the Kenosis passage in Philippians chapter 2 that one day again he's going to receive every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that he is Lord. That he is who he said he is. And so he gets the glory again. And for him not to get that glory is to deny who he is. And when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he set that aside for a purpose. But he still showed us the way he brought the glory to the Father. I do his will. I'm here to do his will. And he said it over and over again. It's an interesting study as you study the Gospels. But go back again, if you would, to Colossians. Let me read while you're going back to Colossians chapter 3. A portion from First, Thess First Chronicle or Corinthians chapter six, he says this: Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived: neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were some of you. I imagine as he wrote that list, he was reminding himself of, oh yeah, I remember so-and-so. That was their problem. That was what they were before they got saved. Yeah, I remember this about them. Such were some of you, but then he goes on and he says the next thing. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Praise the Lord. That's what he's doing in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, all those things, this is where you had your conversation. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has made us alive in Christ. What a, what a privilege is ours. You see, it's all about our salvation in Jesus Christ. So it takes away the pride that any of us would have. But then it does the other side too. It takes away the self-condemnation that any of us want to try and carry. How many times have I run across people that are carrying self-condemnation because they say, well, you know, I was so bad, I did all those things, and how can I do anything for God? How can I be anything for God? You know, this is my life, that's what I did, da-da-da. And it, and it takes away that condemnation because when we realize what Christ did, we are free. We are free to walk with him. We are free to have a life with him. I used to do a lot of bowling. 
And some of you have bowled before, and I used to bowl in tournaments and leagues, and when I had a lousy game, I would go up to the scorekeeper and I'd say, draw a line in there, would ya? A big solid line at the end of that frame. I'm starting over. <laughs> I'm putting that, that was behind me. I had three opens in a row or something, or three. I used to get the big splits, you know. Uh, those were hard to get. And, and so I would put a line there. And that's kind of what God does. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there will be consequences that we may not get out of. That's going to be a part of our life that we have to deal with. But there's no condemnation anymore. Why do we keep condemning ourselves? It's another form of pride. I'm so bad... Yeah, see me, I'm so bad, God can't get me up out of this stuff. You're not so bad. Look at the salvation that he's given. Look at the great things he's done. He has provided a full salvation. There is no excuse for us not to go on in our Christian walk. I always tell people, you know what? I don't need to know the details about all of what you've been. I want to know where are you right now? And if you have unresolved things back there that you need to confess, you need to deal with, that's, that's between you and the Lord. Let's get that dealt with. But if you've got that taken care of, you've resolved those things, you've, you've confessed your sins, where are you right now? Are you walking with God and where are you going? That's what I want to know. And that's what God's doing here as we come to Colossians 3. Now, here's who you are in Christ. Your life is Christ. Because of that, this is who you are. This is what I've done for you. This is your life now. Now, therefore, put to death, mortify, therefore, your members. And in verse 8, he goes on, he says, but now ye also put off all these. Let's go further than the big things. Let's get to the little ones. I do an illustration at camp sometimes. If I haven't done it before at that camp, I, I get out a gold pan, and I like panning gold. I've had the privilege of doing that a few times at a gold mine in Alaska, and a guy taught me how to do it that had a mine up there. And uh, he said, as he was watching me do it, he says, don't give up your day job. If you're going to be panning for gold, you're going to starve to death. I don't know if it was because I was so slow or what, but uh, I did find some gold. It was kind of fun. It does get into your bloodstream a little bit when you're down there and, and for hours sitting there in the creek. You know, to, I know the next pan's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but as you start panning gold, I use the illustration at camps, and I'll get down in the creek there and I get my pan and it's got rocks in it and, and I sift through these things and I get the big ones out and I throw them away. Here's the big rocks. That's obviously not gold. And then I keep washing it with the water and I wash it some more and I get pretty soon I, I, I try and get that gold settled down to the bottom of that pan. I keep working it back and forth and settling it down and, and then I start taking some of the smaller rocks out of there, all those smaller rocks that have come to the surface. And then they say you can actually float the rocks and if you've ever done gold panning, you know what I'm talking about. You get to where you float in the sand and the rocks, and it gets heavy there, and the heavy stuff down, and you kind of just get rid of that, that stuff. And then you get to the very fine particles, and you get to those fine things. And, and, and to me, that's a great, beautiful picture of God sifting you in my life. Taking out the big things first that are detrimental to us. And then he starts getting into the smaller things, little things or attitude things, things that are just not very good for us, things that are going to be bad. That's what he's doing in this passage. He says, mortify in verse 5, these things, these are big things. Then he goes into verse 8 and he says, okay, now let's get a little more pointed here. Let's get into a few small things here. Let's talk about your temper. Let's talk about anger. Anger has the idea of carrying things. People that are angry and bitter all the time, those are fun people to be around, right? Don't you just love them? I'm looking for good friends like that. You know, I just want to have friends that are always angry and bitter. Down on everything in life. Well, what do you do with them? Probably the same thing I do. I avoid them. Don't you? 
I don't want to be around them. God knows that that is detrimental to you and your relationships. And he says, that's going to hurt you, so let's get rid of that. Then he goes into wrath. And wrath, that's a great one. I like that wrath. That's somebody who's explosive. And you never know when they're going to explode. All of a sudden they go, boom, they're mad. They're angry again. And you didn't do anything. What did I do now? Ooh, but <laughs> I've done something. They're angry. If you like that, what do you want to do? I want to hide. I don't want to be close to them. I hate walking on eggshells around people. That's what it's like, isn't it? I have to walk on eggshells for fear I'm going to offend them some way and make them mad. What is easier to do? Let me tell you, I know very well. I've been around people like this. What's easier to do is to avoid them. Go hide in your room. Go out and be out by yourself somewhere because then you don't have to be around it anymore. I had some of this in my lifetime in the past. I, I know what it's like to be around somebody that you're fearful that the next thing you might do will set them off again. God says that's detrimental to your relationships. Get rid of that. That's not going to build your life. You're not going to experience the life that I have for you if you allow that to remain in your life. You're going to hurt yourself and you're going to experience less intimacy and relationships with him and relationships with others that he intended for you. One of the things that, just a thought, I'll give you a thought here just out of, the, I don't think it's like this, but it's a thought that I've had and it's just something uh, that, I, that I wonder if, if God might not do that. What would it be like if God showed us at his judgment seat, what our life could have been like if we truly followed him with our whole heart. You mean I could have had this in my relationships? You mean I could have experienced this if I would have done it your way? You mean that I allowed these things to remain and I could have had that? Why do we let things remain in our lives when God says that shouldn't be there? Why do we allow something to come along? Is it because that's our identity or is it because that's the control that we're trying to seek? That's the way we get a hold of things? I had a guy tell me, he's a Christian guy, he says, and I asked him, I said, why are you swearing on the job? You're a manager at this job. Why do you swear sometimes? He said, hey, it gets my point across. Excuse me, if you need that to get your point across, you are not very good at making your point. Why do you need to use the Lord's name in vain? Why do you need that stuff? He, he thought he needed it. You're even dealing in the world. You don't need it in this world. We can live godly in this present world. And yet we hang on to these things because we think that's the way I am. That's the way I'll always be. I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm trying to... No, we're overcomers in Christ. When we really know who Christ is, when we really know that salvation that he's given us, it's easy to say, okay, God, change me. I want it gone. Here I am, 56 years old, and God still changed me. I'm finally starting to learn something, I think, in my life. I'm just starting to get a hold of some of these things in a way that I really wished I knew years and years ago. And I think of all the things I've missed out on. I, I tell you what, Janine and I have been married 37 years. It's going to be 38 this summer. And uh, we've had a great time. But I sure wish I knew how to love her years ago like I do now. You've heard that expression. When somebody gets saved or married, they don't really know what uh, love really is. Well, I've got to admit that's probably true. <laughs> but I've certainly learned. And I've certainly appreciated my wife more than I ever have in my life. After 37 years. Going on 38 I, look, I just enjoy having her being my companion. That's, I, I'll tell you what, there's nothing better than just having my wife as my companion. I want her around with me. I'm thankful for every day God gives us. 
What a privilege it is to see God build a relationship. My wife's a wonderful person. I'm thankful for all these days and years she's given um, her to me. But I, yeah, I don't take her as I've got to have uh, somebody for my security. I've got to have somebody for my companionship. I still have Christ. You know, that's, that's the privilege that's ours. He's my companion. Even with my wife not being here, I still have him. She's a blessing that he gives me. My family's a blessing. I talked with our son Chris today. What a blessing. What a privilege. He told me he's going to bring the grandkids up in June. I think they're going to stay. I hope he and his wife stay. Um, <laughs> when they bring the grandkids up. <laughs> but, but think about it a little bit. What a blessing they are. They're not a privilege. They're not a right. They're not something that I deserve. No, they're a good gift from my God. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. Do I remember where they came from? Do I remember where those blessings come from? What a privilege. And we can have that intimacy in those relationships. We don't do it when, we're doing it God, uh, when we are doing it with our flesh in control. If you let that anger run you, if you let that temper run you. My wife, when we, before we were married, um, she had a father that was, had a good temper and so when she wanted uh, when we were dating she did everything she could to try and make me mad just to see if I did get mad um, I guess I'm not smart enough to get mad I sometimes don't even know I'm being offended <laughs> somebody <laughs> we had somebody in church at a business meeting three times questioning on some things I just answered the questions somebody after the service said to me pastor do you realize what that person was trying to do they were trying to make you mad they were going after you I said they were <laughs> I didn't realize it I guess my perspective of life is different than that you see I'm thinking about those things that are right I'm thinking about those things that are pure, that are honest, that are real, that are truthful. I'm thinking about those things that are lovely. I'm thinking about things that, that God would do in people's lives, the good things about them. I'm not thinking about the worst things in them. But you know what anger and the temper is? That's you're not getting your way. You want what you want, and it's not happening the way you think it should, and it's not happening when you think it should, and for some reason you're upset. I like the little boy sitting in the back seat of the car as dad's driving through the traffic. And he said to his dad, he must have been about four or five, Daddy, is everybody on the road an idiot but you? <laughs> now, why did he come up with that question? What was he hearing from his father? Yeah. <laughs> Makes you wonder, huh? Well, think about it for a second. Is that detrimental to your relationship? Yes, and God knows that. We can talk about the malice. We can talk about blasphemy. We can talk about filthy communication out of your mouth. We can talk about lying one to another. I'm looking for a good liar for an employee. Those are the best employees you can get, right? Good liars. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I know enough business owners and people that are in business, and I was an assistant manager of Fred Meyer when I was 21, and I did a lot of interviews with people, and I'll tell you what, I know what I was looking for, and it wasn't a liar. I wanted somebody to tell the truth. They said they were going to be there, they'd be there. Somebody that said they were going to do the job, they'd do the job. You didn't have to go check up on them every five minutes, see if they were still doing it, or if they even thought about doing it. They were done. Whatever. I don't want a liar. Lying is going to hurt you. God knows that, and he says, get rid of it. That's going to hurt you. It is not going to build your life. It's detrimental to you. He has a lot of other things as we look at the passage, but he says, 
put off the old man with his deeds. And you look at all the things, and there's a passage in, e in Ephesians chapter 5 where he talks about walking in love, and every one of those things is concerned about the other person, reaching out, giving yourself as an offering and a sacrifice for others. But then he says the detrimental side of that are some of these other things, and that's what he's doing here. And every one of those other things are self-centered, not Christ-centered. I want what I want, and I want it now. You check in your own life, and you see about your own sin, and you will know very well it's because you wanted something, and you wanted it now. You weren't willing to wait on the Lord for whatever it was, or you didn't wait on the Lord to fix the situation. You didn't wait on the Lord to... Uh, you, you, wanted, you were afraid of being embarrassed. You were afraid of being, being overcome in some way by somebody thinking bad of you, so you made up a nice lie for everybody. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but they're all self-centered, not Christ-centered. If your life is centered on Jesus Christ, these things aren't going to be there. Why? Because he knows and he's told us, put these things off. That's detrimental to you. When we have a life that's based and wrapped up in him, then we know that we will see our best from our God. And what do I mean by our best? God loves us. He is going to build your life right. And it will be good for you. Romans 12, 2. That good an acceptable and perfect will of God. It's good. There's no evil in God's will for you. None. It's good. He likes it and you're going to like it. It's, it's acceptable. It's pleasing. He's going to be pleased with it. You're going to be pleased with it. I have talked with a lot of people that have given their life to the Lord, whether they be in full-time Christian service or whether they be saints who have lived and served in the church as whatever capacity that God wanted them to serve as they, they lived in this life. Whatever it is, I've asked, I make it a point to ask people who are up in later years, are you happy with what you have been doing when you walk with God in your life? Are you pleased with it? And they always say, I wish I would have walked with Him more. I wish I'd have been more open to his working and leading in my life. And that's usually the testimony I get. They never say, I wish I'd have done less. No, I look back at my life and I find it was well-pleasing. I hope and pray that by God's grace, as I walk with him, he works in me and through me. And I've seen God do that over and over again, and I praise God for that. And it doesn't matter what we do as a Christian, wherever we go, wherever he would lead us in our walk, to wherever we work, whatever we do, we can be pleasing to our God simply doing his will. You're going to like it, he's going to like it. And you're going to look back at it and you're going to say, I'm thankful for my God and the life he's given, even in the midst of this turbulent, sin-cursed world that we live in. Wow. I think of the perfectness of it, the perfectness of God's will, that it's complete. It has everything I need. Why do we hang on to sin? Why do we hang on to these things that are detrimental to us in our walk? Because we're insecure to give it up. We don't have enough confidence and security in our Christ, in our Lord, to say, I'm giving it up. I'm going to follow you and do what you want no matter what. We're not that sure of that relationship with Him. We're not that confident in Him. And therefore, we hang on to those things. Do I really believe God can build my life? Do I really believe that He's given me a complete salvation? Do I really believe that I have security and stability in Him? And if I do, then these things do not have to be a part of my life. I want to get rid of them. I don't need them. I find them to be a detriment. I find them to be a distraction. I find them to be a, a thing that takes me away from the fellowship with my Savior. The joy of walking with Him and experiencing the life that He has. 
If we have that security and stability, when he says, get rid of that, it's gone. I don't need it because I have him. I don't need those things because I have him. You know, I look forward to eternity, don't you? I look forward to a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I wonder what, how much change, how much differences there are going to be. I can't fathom it in my mind, but I think about it. I look at this world and I think I have a perfect God, but he's dealing with an imperfect me. And by God's grace, I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to go on and experience more of what he has. And if he says change, get rid of this, get that out of your life, and it can even be good things. There's things in, in, that control us that are good. Uh, somebody said to me a while back, you know, is, is Christian music wrong? And I said, yes. You say, what? Well, is a bean wrong? Bean plants in a garden wrong? Yes, if it's in the corn patch. It's in the wrong place. And you can take music, Christian music, and let it control you. Anything that controls your life apart from Christ is wrong. And it can even be right things. Can I say this? I'm in ministry. Ministry can do that. You can get so involved in doing for God that you forget to walk with God. It's easy to do. You actually become disconnected from your spiritual life because you're so busy doing. But I'm doing all the right things. And that's where I believe that we see people that are involved in ministry all of a sudden falling into gross immoral sin because of the disconnect. We have to be careful. Even right things can be detriments to us, can be hurtful to us when they take the place of that relationship with Christ. When we focus on the doing of rather than the walk with our Savior. The doing of our Christian life rather than the intimacy of relationship with Christ. I challenge you tonight because this is a tough subject when we get to it about God taking things out of our life. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about putting things in. And these things are good. These things are good. How many, is look, how many of us would look for somebody who's kind to be a good friend? I like kind people, don't you? They're fun to be around. I like them. God knows that they're good. That's why God says, here, this is good for you. Put it on. We're going there tomorrow night. But tonight, what's in your life that you know very well God doesn't want there? What's controlling your life right now? What's running you right now? And you know God doesn't want it there. You see, some of us allow those things to remain. I don't have to. I can walk with my God. I can experience life, and I can experience life more abundant. And praise the Lord. Does God take us out of this world? No. But we're not of it. We don't have to be controlled by the attitudes and appetites of this world. We don't have to be controlled by the lusts of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We don't have to be controlled by the drives and desires of people around us and the philosophy of this world. I can walk with my Savior and experience life and life more abundant through Him. Challenging to us, isn't it? Are you willing to give up anything God wants you to do? I ask people in ministry that has a vocation, a question at pastor's conference and things. If God says, I don't want you to do anything for me, are you willing to just simply do nothing for God and just enjoy the fellowship with Him? Walk with Him. Or do you feel like you always have to be doing something? Be still and know that I am God. Can you do nothing for God if that's what God wants you to do? What if God wants you to lay in a bed as my friend just went through before he went to be with the Lord and he couldn't preach anymore? 
how would you handle it? Are you willing to let God do with you what He wants? Anything He wants to do in your life. He's my all in all. He's my Savior. He, I am complete in Him. He's all I need. I don't need to hang on to these things of this life. I want to hang on to Him. What a great place for us to go to. What a great place for us to live. I hope and pray that's where you're headed. I hope and pray if you're not there already that you're going that direction. Where have you been? Let's draw a line. If there's things that you need to get rid of, draw that line. Put that behind you. Confess that sin. I'm going on with my Savior. Me and you, God, let's go. I'm moving on. I'm heading with you, God, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do. Because my life is totally yours. I'm open to whatever. My life is yours. You do with me what you want. What a sweet abandonment. I always say this. Whose hands am I better off in? That'll make a commercial on TV. Whose hands are you better off in? The Lord's or yours? Obviously it's the Lord's, isn't it?